Hello, welcome to Ms. Tarnage's Foundation Skills EL Module 4, Unit 1, Lesson 1 for Monday, April 6, 2020. Our standards and objectives for today, we will be doing 4RIKID1, which is refer to details and examples in the text when explaining what the text says explicitly Refer to details and examples in the text when drawing inferences from the text. That basically means we are just going to find information in the text and tell exactly what the text is telling using details and examples. We also will be doing 4RLCS4, four, four, which is determine the meaning of words and phrases as they are used in a text including those that refer to significant characters in situations found in literature and history. So we will be finding the meaning of unfamiliar words and phrases as they are used in a text and use them to refer to major characters and situations in the text. Our foundation skills for the week, we will be looking at the spelling principle words with the VCCCV pattern Decoding with the same pattern of VCCCV. Vocabulary with suffixes ED and LY. We'll be looking at fluency with annotation and our grammar skill for the week is commas. Our spelling principle words with the VCCCV pattern. Let's say our words together. Hundred, supply, single, middle, Explain, surprise, pilgrim, sandwich, instead, complete, monster, settle, address, farther, sample, although, turtle, athlete, orchard, kingdom. Okay, if we look at our spelling principle words with the VCCCV pattern, we have um, two examples here. For most words with the VCCCV pattern, we divide into syllables between the first and second consonants. And if we look at the example sample there, we see that it is divided between the vowel consonant of AM and the rest of the word PLE for the CCV. Some are divided between the second and third consonant with our word sandwich. We see the VCC with AND and it's divided with the rest of the word WICH where we have the two divisions there. Okay. So what we're going to do now, we're going to practice. We're going to be looking at our words with the VCCCV pattern, and we're going to use our spelling words over to the right and fill in the blanks there to the left. Okay, let's look at the first one together. It says that an example and a model. What word over in your spelling list would fit in that category there? Let's look down and see. Let's think what an example is or what a model is. Sometimes we do an example when we learn something new before we practice, and we also model things when we are learning things from your teacher. So let's look down. How about number 15, sample? If I'm going to have an example, a model, would sample be a word that would go along with those two? Yes, it would. I want you to go and pause your video so you can complete this task. When you are ready, resume play. Welcome back. We will now check our answers. For number one, we have sample. For number two, we have the words stock, inventory, and we see that the word that goes with those are supply. We have the word for number three, describe and clarify, would mean to explain. Locate or live would mean settle. Now, settle in this sense is like if you move to an area 
and you take claim and you live there, you settle there. Okay, number five, we have traveler and seeker. That would be like a pilgrim. Beast, creature, that would be monster. Empire, monarchy, would be kingdom. Midpoint, halfway, is also the middle. Lone, solo, that means you are doing it single. Sports person or player, we know that is an athlete. Finish, conclude, we know that we complete something. In place of, rather than, we would do instead. Okay, now we have our um, spelling principle words with the VCCV pattern again, and we're going to do a word search. Word sort, excuse me. We have done this before in class. Remember when we would put the two different patterns at the top of our paper? That's what I would like for you to do now. I want you to get a sheet of paper and write VC slash CCV. And for your example there, I want you to write the word complete. Because if we see there, it has the VC CCV pattern. We would put the slash in between the M and the P there. For my next pattern, I have the VCC slash CV. And our word for an example is athlete. And we would divide between the H and the L. I'm going to give you a few minutes. You may go ahead and pause your video. And when you are complete, you may resume and hit play. Okay, welcome back. And if we see here, we have our two patterns there for us. For our VC slash CCV pattern, we have the word hundred, instead, sample, supply, complete, although, single, monster, turtle, explain, settle, orchard, surprise, address, pilgrim, farther. And for our VCC slash CV pattern, we have the words sandwich, athlete, and kingdom. If you need a second to check over your work, just hit pause and resume when you finish. Okay, for homework, you will need to either print this out or you may come back to the screen here and freeze it but all I want you to do, just like you would do in class, find your words in your paragraph that are misspelled and make the corrections at the bottom. Okay, we're going to move on into our EL. We are actually moving into our fourth and final module of the year. And this one, we're going to do a, a chapter book, and it is entitled The Hope Chest. And these are the guided questions or question that we will be working on throughout this module here. What can we learn from the process of ratifying the 19th Amendment? Okay, we I have a few little words in here that we're not quite sure what they mean, like ratify an amendment. And we're going to get to those in just a little bit. So let's look at this. It says, in 1920, the U.S. Constitution was amended to give women the right to vote. However, this did not allow African-American women to vote. Hmm, that kind of makes me wonder if amended has something to do with the word amendment. Okay, and then it says when people take action against inequality, they can cause social change. Hmm, those are some good points to be thinking about. Okay, our learning targets for the day. I can infer the topic of this module from quotes. I can determine the meaning of unfamiliar words and phrases. Okay, we have seen both of these learning topics before in previous um, modules and lessons. Okay, so let's ask ourselves, what does it mean to infer? Think about that for a second. 
Okay, we know that we use what we know and add it to something. Whoops, skipped over too many. Hold on just a second. Okay, we use what we know and add it to something the text says, and we use it to figure out what the author is wanting us to know or understand. So remember, when we infer something, we take something that we have already learned and it is in our brain, and we take something that the author or the text is telling us, and we put those two together to figure out exactly what that author is wanting us to know or understand. Okay, so now we're going to look at what is a quote. I want you to think about that for just a second. Okay, a quote is something that a writer or speaker has written or said. Okay, what vocabulary skills have we used this year to help us determine the meaning of unfamiliar words? I want you to think about that. What have we used in the past in class when we were reading things that we did not know or understand? What did we use? That's right, we have used context clues, affixes, and roots in dictionaries. Okay, now what we're going to do, we're going to infer the topic. And we see right here, we have a poster walk. And we have done a poster walk in every module that we have done so far this year. When we did um, our first unit with Love That Dog, we did a somewhat of a poster walk there. When we did our animal defense um, module, we did that. And then we also did one with the American Revolution. Okay, this one's going to be just a little bit different here. We have actual quotes here. And these are some things that people... Um, were quoted from in our story, The Hope Chest. Okay, and at the bottom here, we see a picture here, and it says, Opposed to Women's Suffrage. So I want you to look at, look at this um, chart here for just a second. Okay, now we have three photographs here and I'm going to come in just a little bit closer to see if y'all can get those okay um, it says the first is a picket line at college day the next one is um, a guy named John and he is the farm secretary administration and he's at the office of um, war information there and our last picture here is a group of people that are waiting to get on a train, it looks like. So what do you notice about these three pictures here? Okay. So now what I want you to do, I want you to get your paper and I want you to make a chart like we've done before with our I Notice and I Wander note catcher. And what I want you to do, I want you to write down things that you noticed and things that you may wonder about the pictures or the quotes that we saw. You will need to hit pause to do this, and when you are finished, you may resume and hit play. Okay, welcome back. Okay, we have our I Notice and I Wonder chart, okay? And this is what I noticed and I wondered about the chart. I noticed the infer pages had direct quotes. I noticed the pictures showed some kind of separation, and I noticed some people were holding signs. My wonders about that is I wonder why women lost the right to vote. I wonder how people were treated in the pictures. Did you have some of those same notices and same wonders? All right, our guided qu guiding questions are big ideas. Okay, we know that our guiding question is, what can we learn from the process of ratifying the 19th Amendment? Okay, we will be responding to inequality with the ratification on the 19th Amendment 
as the case study of responding to inequalities. What does inequality mean? What familiar word do you see in the word inequality? Do you see a word in, inside of inequality? That's right, equal. And what does equal mean? Equal means the same. So what is the prefix in inequality? That's correct. The prefix is in. What does the prefix in mean? The prefix in means not. So what does inequality mean? If we know that we have the word equal in there and it means, do you remember what we said it meant? And what does the prefix in mean? It means not. So what does the word inequality mean? Correct. Inequality means not equal. So is that kind of giving you some idea of what we may be discussing in this module in this book? Okay, an example of equality is everyone in the United States can now vote because the 19th Amendment was ratified. An example of inequality is only men could vote in the United States because women were not allowed to vote. Okay, do you see how one sentence is showing how they are equal and one is showing how they are not equal? Okay, before we um, begin listening to the Hope Test, let's discuss some words or phrases you may hear throughout the reading of the text. Okay, what does the word vote mean? If you vote on something, what do you do? Vote means to submit your choice between two or more people or things, and others do the same, and the one with the most votes wins. What does it mean to have the right to vote? The right to vote means to be allowed to vote for decisions made in the state or county. For example, who will be president? All right, these are some vocabulary words that you may see or hear throughout the reading of our story. Okay, opposition party. It's a group or groups of people opposed by the government. The Bolshevist, Bolshevist Revolution is when, was when a group of people called the Bolsheviks overthrew the government in Russia and set it up a new government in 1917. Armistice is an agreement made by opposing sides in a war to stop fighting. Congress, the chief group of lawmakers of a country. Amendment, a change in a legal document. Ratification, to, con to confirm something officially by vote. And suffragist is a person working for the right to vote. Okay, so now what we're going to do, we are going to listen to the hope chest. Give those to me at once, young lady. Violet dropped the bundle of letters and looked up at her mother's angry face. She felt guilty, but only for a second. They're mine, she said. They're my letters from my sister. They're addressed to me. Mother made a grab for the bundle and the two of them struggled, each gripping the letters with one fist. Mother used her other hand to try to pull Violet away from the desk by her pigtails and Violet used her other hand to wrench her pigtails free. It was very unladylike, not at all graceful. How dare you, Mother cried, going through my desk drawers. Violet Mayhew, I thought I brought you up better than that. You hit them, Violet screamed, managing to jerk her hair and a few of the letters free. She lurched against Mother's desk, knocking over a vase of asters and a dreadful old hair wreath in a wooden frame. She retreated to the bedroom doorway. I bet Chloe's been writing me for the whole time since you threw her out, and you let me think she'd forgotten all about me. Violet, you know perfectly well your father and I always do what's best for you. Mother had decided to be calm and firm, but there were tears in the corners of her eyes. Violet didn't care. She was too mad to care. 
You hid Chloe's letters from me for three whole years. You stole them from me. Violet retreated out the door. Heavy footsteps thudded up the stairs behind her. Violet turned around and saw Father. It was his newspaper reading time, and Violet and Mother had disturbed it. What in the name of Sam Hill is going on here? Father demanded. I'm sorry, Arthur, said Mother. Violet has stolen some letters from my desk drawer. Violet backed up against the hall mirror. Father towered. He was broad and massive like the bank where he worked. He had left his jacket downstairs, but he still looked imposing in a black broadcloth vest and trousers and a spotless white shirt with a high starched collar. He glared down at Violet through his gold-rimmed spectacles. Why are you downstairs reading to your brother? He demanded. Violet had no good answer. She had sat with Stephen, but hadn't bothered to read to him since she'd finished all her Oz books. Instead, she'd written a letter to her cousin and had been looking through Mother's desk for a stamp when she found the letters. Give those back to your mother at once, young lady, said Father. They're addressed to me, Violet said, from Chloe. She shifted toward the hall corner, toward the dog's leg turn that led to the back stairway. Standing up to father was a lot scarier than standing up to mother, partly because he so seldom spoke to her. I won't, she said. Then give them to me. Father held out his hand. At once, young lady, or you are going to be in so much trouble it will make your head swim. I don't care, said Violet. She didn't. She was madder than she'd ever been in her life. They told her to be seen and not heard and to speak only when spoken to. They sent her sister away and stuck her with a brother who wouldn't even talk. Then they hid her own letters from her and called it stealing when she found them. It was wretched that just because a person happened to be 11 years old, that person didn't have any say in things at all. Not even about getting to read her own letters. Father moved toward Violet, a huge threatening tower of authority. Mother seemed to disappear from Violet's field of vision. Father had always had a way of making mother disappear. Violet darted around the corner and clattered down the curving back staircase and out through the kitchen where Eleanor, the cook, was making boiled custard. She slammed the screen door and ran all the way to the banks of the Susquehanna River. She had only grabbed a few letters from the middle of the stack. The postmark on the first envelope was from 1918, two years ago. She sat down at her favorite spot under an old elm tree that grew on the riverbank and began to read. New York City. Saturday, November 9th, 1918. Dear Violet, well, I voted. It was nothing like Father warned me. There were no gangs of hoodlums standing at the top of the steps to throw down voters from the opposition party. I did not lose my femininity. I didn't have to drag my skirts through the mud and muck of national politics. My skirts are eight inches from the ground and the muck of national politics turned out not to be that deep this year. There were thousands of women voting, and yet New York did not have a Bolshevist revolution. Not yet, anyway. It's only been a few days. Did the false armistice happen in Susquehanna, too? Thursday, the newsboys were out on the streets hollering that the war was over. I was treating influenza patients on the fifth floor of a tenement house, and everybody dashed down the stairs and out into the street, cheering and throwing their hats in the air. But then it turned out not to be true, of course. Everyone says the war can't last much longer now. A lot of the countries in Europe have given women the vote you know, now, you know. Some of them have only given it to women whose sons were killed in the war. That makes me really angry, as if women are only as good as men if their sons die. But the United States doesn't even have that. At least women can vote in New York State now. That makes 16 states plus the territory of Alaska. Ah, Alaska. Speaking of soldiers, how is Stephen doing? I hope you aren't reading the war news to him. I know Father always says that's what he'll want to hear, but somehow that doesn't seem very likely to me. Write if you can. The address is on the envelope. Your loving sister, Chloe. Violet smiled because the letter sounded so much like Chloe. And Alaska. Chloe had always wanted to go to Alaska. She'd taken out every book the library had about Alaska, and she'd drawn Violet a picture of an Eskimo driving a dog sled. Violet had asked for an igloo too, but Chloe had said that Alaskan Eskimos didn't live in igloos. Violet looked at the envelope. The address was somewhere in New York City, Henry Street. The next letter gave her a jolt. November 20th, 
1918. Dear Violet, I can't tell you how sorry I am about Flossie. You know, Father wouldn't let me in to see you, don't you? I drove up as soon as I heard about it from Cousin Helen and was in Susquehanna the next morning. Had to stop in Scranton overnight after the Hope Chest blew a tire, its second on the trip, and it was too dark to see to change it. Mother wanted to let me in, I think, but Father said no, and all I could think of was you all alone upstairs in our old bedroom with your thoughts. I wish I could call, but even if I had enough money for long distance, Father would just hang up. Write to me, all right? I want to know how you're doing, and wear your face mask every time you go out so you don't get the flu. Love, Chloe. Violet felt a sharp twist in her stomach. Reading the letter made it feel as if her best friend, Flossie, had just died yesterday instead of almost two years ago. It had happened right near where she was sitting now, on the banks of the Susquehanna. She and Flossie were playing Nellie Bly. Nellie Bly was a newspaper reporter who reported the war from the trenches on the Western Front, and Flossie wanted to grow up to be just like her. So that day, they were playing that Flossie was Nellie Bly, and Violet was a captured German soldier. Only suddenly, Flossie had complained of a backache, and then she had gotten a nosebleed, and Violet had said, your ear's bleeding, Flossie. And by the time she'd helped Flossie home, Flossie was bleeding out of both ears and her nose and couldn't talk. That was the influenza, like getting run over by a steam train. Not just the sniffles, but blood pouring out of your nose and ears. People didn't understand how the disease could hit that hard, could kill so many people when it was only the flu. Except that after 1918, it would never be only the flu again. Violet clenched the letter in her hand and was furious at mother and father. In those awful bleak days after Flossie died, it would have meant a lot to have Chloe sitting at the foot of her bed again, talking to her and telling her stories. She couldn't believe mother and father had sent Chloe away when Violet needed her, just because Chloe was a new woman who wanted to vote and have a job of her own. She was still Chloe. Violet read the next letter. December 1st, 1918. Dear Violet, how are you? The influenza is really bad here. I treated 85 patients in the tenements behind Hester Street yesterday. I start at the bottom of one building and work my way up, calling on patients. And then when I get to the roof, I step across onto the next building and work my way down. Don't worry, there's no space in between the buildings. I called on one family where the mother, father, and six children were all sick in one little room and all huddled into one bed. None of them spoke any English. So far, I haven't gotten the flu, touch wood, because I'm careful to wear my mask all the time. Are you wearing yours? They also gave us, all of us public health nurses, an inoculation at the Henry Street Settlement House, but we think that it's a placebo, a fake shot to make us think we're protected. The other night I had a funny accident. I was coming home in the dark after seeing 107 patients and I crashed right into a young man carrying a shovel. We both went sprawling into the gutter, which was not exactly clean. I guess there are still more horses than motor cars in New York. It turned out the poor fellow had been digging graves, which is a pretty big job these days. Anyway, he was very polite and forgiving and walked me home. Please write and let me know how you're doing. I think about you all the time. Love, Chloe. That letter started stupid tears in Violet's eyes again, and she dashed them away with the sleeve of her midi blouse. She thought about Chloe all the time too, so that was what Chloe was doing, being a public health nurse. During the huge scene after Chloe bought the hope chest, Chloe had shouted something about wanting to do something meaningful with her life. Mother had cried and asked her what wasn't meaningful about marrying an up and coming man like Mr. Russell, or was it Mr. Rice? and having beautiful babies. Violet, listening on the stairs, had known just what Chloe meant. At school, Violet's class was knitting squares to make blankets for French war orphans. Miss Smedley read to the class. Ivanhoe was what she was reading to them just then, for half an hour each day while they knitted. And although Miss Smedley tried to make a game of it by keeping score of who knitted more squares, the boys or the girls, to Violet, knitting those squares seemed like the most important thing she had ever done in her life. She felt as though she was part of something huge, something vital, something that involved the whole world, or at least much more of the world than she had ever seen. Mr. Rice, or was it Mr. Russell, 
had no very high opinion of women working or voting or doing anything interesting. Both Mr. R's worked for father at the bank and they still came to Sunday dinner every week, even though Chloe was no longer around for either of them to marry. Last Sunday, they tried to outdo each other making jokes about women voting. Can you imagine if women were actually allowed to vote? Mr. Russell had asked. Elections would have to go on for days with all those women standing in the voting booths not being able to make up their minds. Not only that, but they'd be standing up on their little tippy toes trying to peer into other booths to see who the other women were voting for, said Mr. Rice. Violet couldn't imagine why mother and father had thought Chloe would marry either one of them. She eagerly unfolded the next letter. Dear Violet, December 20th, 1918. Dear Violet, Merry Christmas. I've been thinking about you a lot. I wish I could come see you for Christmas, but Father would just slam the door in my face again, so it would be a waste of gasoline at more than 20 cents a gallon. Did I tell you the hope chest gets 25 miles to the gallon, though? It's great. The influenza seems to be spreading a little less this week, touch wood. I hope you are still well. A friend of mine was very bad with it, but he's better now, and I think he will live. It was scary, though. The federal government has started deporting foreign-born radicals to Russia. Can you imagine? A lot of them didn't even come from Russia. Some of them have lived in this country nearly all their lives. But I guess that's what happens when you have a war. People start hating immigrants. I think there are people who just need someone to hate. I just hope they don't deport all of them. Some of them are such dear people. I hope you can come to New York City one day. You never saw a place so alive with so many different ideas being talked about in so many different languages. New York City is a college education in itself. Still, I, I hope that you, at least, will find a way to go to college. And I mean a whole four years of it. Love, Chloe. Violet put the letter down and looked out at the muddy waters of the Susquehanna slipping by. Chloe made what their mother had always called the wrong sort of people sound really interesting, which Violet had always suspected they might be. She made them sound downright uplifting. Wasn't it just like their parents to want to keep Violet away from anything interesting? Chloe was wrong about Violet finding a way to go to college, though. Violet didn't want to go to college. School was boring, and the sooner she was out of it, the better. Besides, father was against college for girls. The next thing in the pile wasn't a letter, but a slender, ten-framed snapshot. Stephen and Chloe, when they were teenagers, sat stiffly in their Sunday best and held Violet, who wore a white dress with enormous skirts that covered both their laps. She had been a plain baby, Violet thought, just like she was a plain girl, with straight brown hair that had never curled and never would, and a stub nose and ordinary brown eyes. Mother must have stuck the picture into the pile of letters, but why? so that she would remember what Chloe looked like? Or was she trying to hide Chloe so she for could forget her? January 15th, 1919. Dear Violet, Happy New Year. I would have written sooner, but there have been some bad relapses and flu cases, as well as some other things that have been keeping me very busy. I hope you were thinking about what I said about college. I know it seems far away when you were in fourth grade. College arms you to fight the great battles. I learned that from Miss Lillian Wald. She is the founder of the Henry Street Settlement House where I'm doing my nurse training. She invented public health nursing, you know? She says the influenza has been a baptism by fire for all of her trainees. I hope I never see anything worse. Speaking of battles, it looks as though Congress is going to take up the Susan B. Anthony Amendment when it reconvenes. That's the amendment poor Miss Anthony wrote back in 1878. Congress voted it down back then. To think, women could have gotten the vote 40 years ago. It needs a two-thirds vote of both houses of Congress to pass, which means it's going to be a huge knockdown, drag-out fight. And Congress has defeated it before. If they do pass it, it will go to the states for ratification, and then it will be part of our U.S. Constitution. Part of me really wants to go to Washington to help Miss Alice Paul and the National Women's Party work for that amendment, but I also want to stay here and finish my nurse's training, especially now that my baptism by fire is over, touch wood and cross fingers. There are other things that make me want to stay in New York too, but a woman shouldn't let herself be ruled by those sorts of things. 
love Chloe. Violet couldn't figure out what the last two sentences of that letter meant. Chloe's life in New York sounded thrilling. Violet imagined Chloe climbing up and down towering tenement buildings, risking death by influenza or falling off a roof to bring help and hope to hundreds of suffering people. It sounded a lot more exciting than marrying one of the Mr. R's. Violet eagerly opened the next letter. February 18, 1919. Dear Violet, you still haven't written back to me. I hope you're not still angry with me for leaving. You know, I really couldn't do anything else. I didn't want to marry Mr. Russell or whoever else they found for me and turn into a good little help me hosting dinner parties and having babies and never again having a thought or idea or dream of my own. I wonder if mother ever had a dream before she married father. Well, it's too late for me to ask her now. Last week, I drove the hope chest out to Long Island with some girls from one of the worst tenements on Hester Street. None of them had ever seen an open field before. They couldn't believe all the space. I wish you could have been with us. The hope chest got two flat tires, one on the way there and one on the way back. But fortunately, a friend of mine showed me how to patch them myself. Everyone agrees that a lady motorist should know how to change a tire but considering how often they burst, I'm glad I know how to patch them now as well. Some people think that us suffragists, or is it we suffragists, hate men, but that's not true at all. Lots of men are really nice, like my friend who showed me how to patch tires. There's a difference between liking men and wanting to have them run your whole life. Well, that's neither here nor there. I hope you were getting along all right. Remember that when I was in eighth grade, and my friend Dottie Armitage died of consumption. I didn't want to be friends with anyone else for a long time. I thought that would somehow be disloyal to Dottie. It wasn't true though, and I hope you know it isn't true about Flossie either. When a friend dies, some of her always stays inside of us. Write back if you can. Love, Chloe. Violet felt peculiar. It was as if Chloe had read her mind. Back then, that is. She had felt just that way when her grief started to ease enough that she could sometimes laugh and have fun and want to be with people again. She would felt as if she'd be betraying Flossie if she made other friends. Violet threw the letter angrily down on the riverbank beside her. It would have been great to read this letter back then. The last letter was just a note. April 15, 1919. Dear Violet, this clipping is a poem that was in the newspaper the other day. It's called Aftermath, and it's by a, name, a man named Siegfried Sassoon, who was in the British Army. I wish you'd read it to Steve, Stephen. You know, there's going to be a League of Nations. Everyone says we will never have a war again. I hope that's true. Violet looked in the envelope, but there was no clipping. Either it had fallen out or Mother had taken it when she'd read the letter. That was what made Violet snap. Mother had read all these letters. Maybe father too, but it was mother who she felt ought to have known better. Mother had kept Chloe's interesting news and comforting thoughts from Violet when Violet had needed them the most. And there were more letters besides these two that Violet had managed to rescue. Violet knew they wouldn't be in the desk anymore. They'd be hidden somewhere she couldn't find them or even burned. All her life, Violet had accepted that her parents had made decisions and whether Violet liked it or not, that was the way things were. But this was too much. The letters had been written just for her, by Chloe, the only person in the family who had ever told her anything except how to behave. And she hadn't stolen them. They'd been stolen from her. It was completely unfair, and Violet wasn't going to put up with it. The Hope Chest, Chapter 1, The Stolen Letters. Okay, so now we have listened to the whole chest. Who can tell me what is the gist of the first chapter? What is the first chapter mostly about? What was the main idea of that chapter there? Back a little bit, hold on. Hit the wrong button again. Okay, Violet finds letters that her sister Chloe has written, which her mother has hidden from her. She learns about what Chloe is doing. So that's what this first chapter is about. She goes and she finds letters that her sister Chloe has written her. Okay. 